Well, he and I met years ago at the Memphis Open, and unfortunately, the Memphis Open is no longer in existence. But Brett Haber is certainly doing so much great work in sports casting. You know him so well with all of his continued success at Tennis Channel. And rumor is, Brett, that you had to build a new room, another room in your house because of how many Emmys you have. And am I... Right? <laughs> well, uh, so, A, thanks, Brian. It's good to see you. <laughs> yes, the stuff about Memphis is true, and it's a shame that tournament doesn't exist anymore. Know about the Emmys, and let's, let's be honest, okay? The Emmys were regional Emmys when I was a local news anchor. And <laughs> you and I, you know, it's just between us chickens. <laughs> um, they're smaller. They don't matter. You don't get a bonus for winning them. They've got all kinds of cats. Like I think one of the categories is like best decaffeinated coffee in the break. Oh, stop it. <laughs> stop. Um, so, and plus who cares, right? I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not super uh, impressed with myself. Uh, <laughs> this, this business will humble you and uh, winning Emmys uh, is certainly not a reason to uh, lose that humility. <laughs> Well, I think you're just being hard on yourself. I think you deserve to to look at those with pride, and I know you do. But I, like I said, I, I admire you, and I've looked up to you, and just some of the highlights from your career. Obviously, you were, I think, 24 years old when you started anchoring on SportsCenter in the 90s, which is an incredible feat. You've always found that propensity to – be at ease in the limelight. And I want to ask you about that because even when you were really, really young and, and you were getting your, your career started, it always felt like the moment was, was never too big for you. And that just shows that kind of a foreshadowing for what was to expect in your career doing the Olympics and certainly emceeing the Tennis Hall of Fame induction ceremony. So a lot going on here, but I'm Brian Fenley. I'm a national radio anchor for Fox Sports Radio and, and Brett, let me start here. If you were to write your autobiography, what's the title of the book? <laughs> um, that is such a, uh, an interesting and highfalutin question because uh, I've never considered writing an autobiography. I don't think my story is that interesting. Oh. Uh, no, no, I, listen, I, I, we're on a podcast for sportscasters so, or, or whatever this is, a Zoom yeah, a conference. So I, I know that's what we're talking about. I, I'm particularly, um, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little uh, ill at ease talking about myself that way. But but since that's the point of this, uh, I, I don't know what my autobiography would be titled, it would be uh, certainly on a back shelf. I, I, I <laughs> it's funny, but but to your point, I, I, I kind of get what you're getting at. And uh, also to sort of the point you made in your opening comment about being at ease in quote unquote the limelight. I, I, I don't think about the limelight a lot. I'm certainly at ease in front of a camera mm. and at ease um, speaking extemporaneously about sports. And I have a level of confidence in sort of what my skill set is and, and what it isn't. And I think the reason I have been at ease in this medium since I was 22, 23, 24 years old, is that it's the only thing I know how to do. Um, I, I'm not, um, I wouldn't be that confident in another setting where I didn't have, as Malcolm Gladwell refers to, that 10,000 hours and more mm -hmm. having done this. Um, I, I, I know what I am and what I'm not. So yeah, I, this is a very comfortable uh, venue for me. I, I feel like I have gone through the right steps of learning at different levels of the business. I've made a ton of mistakes. I've had my on-air grad school at, at ESPN. And so I, I don't think it's that I'm prepared or necessarily comfortable with the limelight, but that limelight comes with, and by the way, limelight, I'm a sportscaster at a tennis channel. I'm not, uh, um, it's, 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 a, it's a very interesting life with the, most minor level of notoriety, which is just perfect. <laughs> not, not anything, that's all I have, that's, I don't deserve anymore, and that's just fine. Um, but it, whatever that level of notoriety is, comes with this job that I know how to do, and that I've trained myself for for the last 25, 30 years. So I, I, 
Um, I, I'm proud of this thing that I've, the skill that I've developed and, and what I know how to do, this thing that you're also developing and, and now know how to do. And it's gratifying to me having met you at a time when you were aspiring to do it and now you're doing yeah. it. Um, yeah, no, I, I remember that stage. Um, and I, I, you're in your thirties, you're past the beginning stages, but, uh, yeah, so, so that's, that's just it. I, I, I do one thing as the expression on the, <laughs> <laughs> you had one thing, um, and that, that's what I know how to do. I would argue, Brett, that you said that you were comfortable doing this in your 20s. I would say, actually, you were comfortable doing this when you were younger because you had been open about being on NBC's Main Street in 1986, which you had termed something sort of like a kid's version of 60 Minutes, and Brian Gumbel was there, and you were like a kid correspondent. Why do you think you were such a natural even at that age? It's a very fair question. I did that when I was 16, and uh, that show, I, I don't know if it was a, if I said it was a kid's version of 60 Minutes, that I might have been uh, ambitious. It was, a, it was a, the only way it was like 60 Minutes, <laughs> the magazine show. Okay. The host was Brian Gumbel, who was certainly of that caliber. Uh, the correspondents were kids, and so, um, but it was a, a remarkable opportunity that I got just through a stroke of luck. Uh, I went to public school in New York City growing up. Uh, I was a sophomore or a junior in high school, and they had launched this show, and producers literally came through my school and went to a couple of, I, I think they were either English classes or communications classes, and this one producer in particular who was trying to find the kids to be the kid correspondents really was just looking for a kid who could put three sentences together and not rule on himself. And uh, I could do that. And I, I can't tell you why I could do that. I mean, a lot of kids could do that. But was I one of those kids who sat in his bedroom, you know, mock play by playing basketball wow. and looking at his hairbrush? Absolutely. That was me. <laughs> I bet that was you. And I bet that was, you know, any number of people in our industry, yeah. any number of aspiring sports. So, I, I mean, so I got that gig. I mean, it wasn't a paying gig, but I did a, a couple of stories for that show. And uh, I developed uh, a relationship at NBC that uh, turned into an internship at the Today Show my senior year of high school, because a lot of the people that worked on that show, Brian Gumbel was the host of the Today Show at the time, also the host of the show Main Street, which was just a monthly show that, that aired in the after school hour on NBC. Fun fact, my debut on that show was preempted originally because it was scheduled to air this is uh, not necessarily a fun fact because there's nothing fun about what happened. It's an, an interesting fact. It was preempted the day the space shuttle Challenger exploded. Oh, sure. Uh, okay. Uh, so that was 86 or five. Thing. Um, anyway, so I, I just met people at the Today Show. That turned into an internship. And when I went to college, there was an NBC station near the college that I went to. And I ended up getting a job as a stagehand there. And that morphed into a job on the air. And it was just this bizarre sequence of events, coincidences, luck, uh, making some good fortune happen um, that just comprised this bizarre road that I've traveled. You forgot the other part, the most important part, the talent that you have as well. But, but, I, but rest assured, I, I, like, I have no shortage of uh, self-possession and ego, but I had no uh, discernible talent. I mean, other than as I mentioned, putting three sentences together without drooling. <laughs> if I showed you my audition tape from the first sports anchor job that I ever had at WNNE in White River Junction, Vermont, and I, that tape exists, I have it somewhere. Um, it, it would be one of, it, it's not um, Boom Goes the Dynamite. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's closer to that. Sure. Than where we are today. Let's just the tape, while you're being hard on yourself, the tape would improve when you went to Sports Center and were at ESPN. And I was going through YouTube. They've got you on Sports Center anchoring, and you were part of the broadcast when Michael Jordan decided to come back. And you're on set. And what was this? In the 90s, obviously, when he wanted to make his return. And here you are breaking that news. What was it like being able to be on top of that and, and seeing that moment unfold on set at SportsCenter? 
so I'm, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I have no particular recollection of that night, except that it's been, I've seen it on YouTube. Also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Friends of mine should like send it to me on Twitter or whatever. So I, I remember it secondhand by seeing the video. But I, I guess that's sort of indicative of what that experience was like for me. I was there for uh, a little over three years. And I don't know if I did 500 sports centers or six or 700 sports centers. Um, but that, that was the whole thing. You said your skills got better quickly after. So I, I, had, I worked in a couple of local markets and I got to sports center and, and those reps started to accrue. And obviously the best way to get better at doing anything is to do it over and over again and be bad and evaluate your mistakes and, uh, you know, take critical looks at your work and the nuances of it. And so, yeah, I, I think I did get better quickly and they weren't hiring, you know, schlubs at, at sports center. Sure. So, I think more than remembering that night or any particular night, and I, I have some some fond memories of, of particular things. Um, I I just remember the drill and sort of the experience and the the sort of the first of all being alongside very talented people who, as you know, have gone on to some are still there and, and others sure. have gone on to do amazing things at other places. But I was there at, at a time. I probably hosted most with Craig Kilborn and then, you know, we would do the 2 a.m. sports. So this is at a time when there were fewer versions of Sports Center, but the 2 a.m. version East Coast would re-air in the morning. There was no original uh, live Sports Center in the morning. I think the first, for a while, I think the first live Sports Center was 6 p.m. the next day. Or at, maybe at, at some point there was like a two, but I think that was the case. So we would re-air all day the next day. But then uh, the 11 p.m. Sports Center was was Dan and Keith. And the rotation on the six was a combination of Bob Lee and Charlie Steiner and Robin Roberts and uh, Carl Ravitch was in there and Steve Levy was in there. And um, you know, Chris Berman, I think at that point wasn't doing a ton of Sports Center anymore, but, but occasionally and uh, Chris Fowler and Mike Tirico and these amazing people from my generation of sportscasting that, uh, you know, you, you learn by osmosis by watching them do their thing. Everybody made everybody better. It was pretty collegial um, and sort of being in that, you know, being in that room when it happened, it was, was I, I view it as my grad school. It was about the length of grad school, law school, business school, whatever. And by the time I got out of there, I felt like I had been in just about any situation you could be in, in a live sort of news-based, highlight-based sportscast. And I mean, everything from breaking news and stories like you were describing to late highlights to power going out in the studio and you know cameras and lights and no monitors, and whatever, you know, you just, you, you, you trial by fire. And then I think that has a lot to do with why when, you know, your very kind assertion that I, I look like I'm comfortable. And what, I think it's because I, I've been in or a, a lot of situations. I've been, so, you know, confidence, this is one of the things I tell young uh, people in the, that are aspiring to get in this business is that unfortunately, the one thing you can't fake right. <laughs> is confidence, right? And I, I, I couldn't mean that more sincerely because, so let me just give you an example, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so, so when I was anchoring local news here in Washington and before that in New York, we'd have interns, whatever, they'd come in for a semester and they'd work and they'd, you know, bust their butts. And then one of the rewards you get aside from college credit at the end of the semester, most of them want to be anchors. You give them a, a shot to make an audition tape in the studio using the scripts and the tapes from one of your sports casts. And that's very customary at almost every station I imagine around the country and, and networks too. And invariably with, with almost no exception, and this includes kids who would go on to be very good at this, who however many years later are in the business and doing well and have quote unquote talent, they all of their uh, audition tapes at the end of their semesters sucked. And it was not a reflection on them. It was a reflection on, they were extremely nervous. They had one shot at it and they had no real practice or reps yeah. or anything inside them to instill 
that real confidence, not the fake confidence that you go up on a set and you smile and you put, that's fake confidence. Real confidence comes from the knowledge that it doesn't mean you're not going to screw up. Mm -hmm. I have a ton of confidence and I screw up all the time. What the confidence does is it lets me know in my head that, okay, I just screwed up, but don't panic because you'll yeah. be fine tomorrow because you have 25 years of having done this well that tells your brain, don't worry about it. It's, you just slipped on something. It's Those kids never have that when they get up there to make their audition tape. And so no matter how much they puff their chests out and try and try to be calm and try to be smooth, they're not because they, they're not really confident and you can't fake it. So I, I had a lot of conversations after those auditions didn't go well, putting an arm over a shoulder saying, hey, don't worry about it. I oh. promise you get your first job anywhere any size market and just do this and when you do it every night watch after six months after you're then you're going to start to have the confidence then you're going to be good then you're going to not worry and watch how fast you get better and that's exactly what happens all the time to everybody that has that skill set and there's just it's you can't <laughs> you can't it's very difficult to console those kids after they crash and burn in a, in a, in a practice thing but it's very very difficult to pretend to be confident in something that you intrinsically know you're, you, you don't have the foundation for. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense. Or no, it does. Sense. Yeah. We're talking with Brett Haber, known now for all of his work on Tennis Channel. I'm Brian Fenley with Fox Sports Radio. Brett, when was the most, when was the time when you were the most emotional on the air? Um, boy. I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't know that I've done a ton of content that, that lends itself to that, to be perfectly honest. I, I'd love to tell you that I had a, a real sort of seminal moment of, I mean, I, I can't say that, I mean, we've done some, some, we've had some people at Tennis Channel that have been very inspiring in some of the feature stories that, that we've done and guests that have joined us uh, who've overcome some remarkable physical uh, and emotional obstacles to sort of view sports as a vehicle to to reclaim parts of their lives that they had lost. Those are always compelling stories. I, I, you know, you've seen them in, in, in all venues. Um, I, I can't say that that's been a, a real, I don't have a particular memory about this. Certainly people, um, I, I've never been an, on the air in the middle of, you know, a crisis or a tragedy or, or anything like that. I, I, I can say that um, my, probably the, the right answer to that question is that I was, I was sports, and, and, and let me preface this by saying I'm a sports anchor and I was at the time a sports anchor. So my role in this was, you know, in that context, but I, I was anchoring, I was the main sports anchor at WCBS in New York uh, over 9-11. And so, you know, what's, what does that have to do with anything and who cares about sports in the midst of that? Nobody does is the answer. The only thing I can tell you is that we, um, it was for a, it was an all hands on deck situation and, and the WCBS, if I recall correctly, did not go off the air and did not take a commercial break for a period of weeks after. Wow. The and so they were broadcasting local news. I think with the, you know, the exception where they break away for evening news at 6.30 and then they'd come back in 24 seven for weeks and weeks and weeks. So it became a question of, of you know, just people anchoring. And so I, I chipped in and did some things in a news context and, and tried to, and I remember getting on the air that for, at first, um, I lived in Manhattan about 12 blocks away from, from the CBS studios. And so there was an initial thing when it happened that they were sealing off Manhattan. And I know a lot of our anchors lived either in Westchester or Connecticut or in New Jersey. And so there was some question whether they were gonna be able to get into New York. Mm. Presume, you know, yeah. like it, it, part of me in my head was like, oh Jesus, get a suit on and get down there. You may have to get up, like, that's how my head was. And then I got down there and everybody was there. So, you know, thank God. But over the course of that, even that first day, we started to do stories of, of sports within the context of American tragedy. So how, for example, did the NFL handle uh, their schedule when President Kennedy was, uh, mm. uh, sorry, you know, so they were, the, 
I'm, I'm, I'm reaching to try to answer your question. They, they weren't particularly emotional moments, but it was my role in an overarching, my small role in, in an overarching, obviously very emotional story. And, and certainly evoked a lot of emotions to be on the air in New York those days to, to get to go to ground zero in the days after you know the attack. So again, not to overstate it in any way, I, I was a sports anchor, but on the air in New York at a station, by the way, that lost two uh, technicians who were stationed uh, at our transmitter in one of the towers. Uh, uh, it was it was certainly emotional to be to be there and be part of it. I didn't play any uh, meaningful role in that, so I just didn't don't want to overstate it. But certainly, though, yeah, as I think about it, that was uh, emotional for everybody to to be a part of. In New York. No question, and you had to to be adaptive to that situation, and, and certainly you were. How about the tennis match that you've called, Brett? That's given you the biggest adrenaline rush. Uh, that's a good one. Um, Again, I mean, thousands at this point of tennis matches. Yeah. Some of them would probably surprise you and, and aren't Grand Slam matches. And, you know, part of the joy of this, of working at Tennis Channel is that we, you know, we feel or take great pride in sort of carrying the banner for this sport 52 weeks a year, seven days a week. So some people who aren't hardcore tennis fans may only really you know, cast their gaze on the sport during the four majors. Other people love it all the time. We love Memphis and yeah. Belgrade and <laughs> you know, Queens Club and Adelaide and all these week to week tournaments. But for sure, the slams, I'd say the most, mem you know, a couple of the most memorable matches would be the, the I called, uh, Jim Courier and I called the Wimbledon final uh, two years ago between Federer and Djokovic that, that was the first uh, 12 all tie break to 13 12 uh in the fifth win for uh, Djokovic where Federer had match points um I called the Serena um did I call the Serena Stozer match at the U.S. Open 2011 that final where she kind of got uh excited um there was a match a couple of years ago in D.C. that uh, between Kyrgios and Tsitsipas that was one of my favorite matches that I ever called that had wow. the chaos. Look it up on YouTube. It was awesome. It was, it was, uh, Kyrgios was getting crazy. Sitsipas was busting his shoelaces and had to go up into the crowd. And then Kyrgios delivered the shoes like he was a, a royal courtier on a pillow. <laughs> it was just, it was one of those, it, it, it's, it was a chaos match. And then I actually, to be honest, I took a lot of pride and have strong memories of broadcasting the first exhibition that we did during the pandemic. We did a, a tennis channel never shut the lights off. We, we were, we're really proud of that. Uh, we did original programming, uh, three hour tennis channel live studio shows every day during the pandemic. And then uh, when exhibitions started getting organized in socially distant ways, we started broadcasting those. And we did the first one at a private home in West Palm Beach, Florida, four guys and all robo cams and jibs. And it was, I mean, it, now, right, uh, nine months into the pandemic or 10, however many we are, um, these social distancing measures and these cleanliness measures seem second nature to us. That was the first, right? I mean, washing the hands and people washing the net and the as separate tennis balls in separate boxes for each guy to serve with. So no one guy wasn't touching the other guy's tennis balls and everything was drones and jibs and robo cams and social distancing. And we were super proud that in this, we were like in this dearth of sports at the time that I, I we think anyway, that it was the first pro sports event to come back for guys in exhibition, there was money. So it was, uh, and yeah, I, I have a big memory and a big level of pride of having been part of that and uh, helped uh, usher sports back in a, in a safe way in a very uncertain world. How did working during that time as someone who called tennis matches, but also waded through doing studio programming, did that challenge you as a broadcaster and test you in a way that you've never been tested before? Um. 
I think it was a, a situation the industry had never been in before. I'm not sure it tested the anchors and hosts as much. I think we were prepared for that. And I, I think that goes back to sort of the other conversation about a, a life's work preparing you for sort of whatever eventuality arises. I mean, at the end of the day, we were just hosting shows. They were a little bit longer with a little less uh, obvious content to talk about. So I think the creativity was on the part of the producers who came up with sort of themed shows for weeks at a time and blocks of, of things to, to make the show around. And then it's sort of, you know, it's what we're doing, right? It's a couple of MOOCs sitting around talking <laughs> about stuff. We had three or four MOOCs and, uh, you know, we, it, we had conversations and they were either interesting or not some days more, <laughs> more than others. And I, I was, it wasn't, particularly challenging. I mean, I think a lot of people lost work, to be honest. I mean, I think, you know, our people less lost less than a lot of other people because our, our, our network took great pains to, to sort of get on the air and stay on the air. Um, so no, I was, any hardships or adaptations that that involved, I think were over shadowed by gratitude that people had for the opportunity to get back on the air and, and keep doing this because that wasn't the case everywhere. And there were people who lost jobs and people whose sports did not come back or entire seasons were canceled. And that's the hardship, uh, you know, for those of us who were on the air working, you know, I think we were the lucky ones. We're talking with Brett Haber of Tennis Channel. Now I'm Brian Fenley, an anchor at Fox Sports Radio. My final question for you, Brad. Final and question, that's it? We don't, uh, <laughs> well, you are a very fine. busy guy. I thought you... Really? Okay. Really? No, no, I mean, what? I've, I've, yeah, my, my kids are online doing school. They're, you know, until lunch, we're good. But yeah. Okay. Just, well, just, one of the questions that I wanted to, to definitely squeeze in was you've had the opportunity multiple times to be part of tennis Olympic coverage. And back in 2016 at Rio, you are a savant when it comes to research and preparing. And I've, I've listened to your podcast on, on tennis.com where you talked about just the countless hours that you will put in and how you will wait for that perfect moment to use a nugget and you won't rush it. It's a good nugget in a match and you won't rush it. But when you look at your time in Rio, what was something that you couldn't prepare for? Like you had done this so much. You had been traveling the world. But when you got to Rio, as far as a tennis broadcaster, what was that environment like in, in a way what it surprised you? It, it presented things, challenges to you that you hadn't been prepared for. Um, so this is going to really burst your bubble. Uh, <laughs> when I got to Rio, my first reaction was, man, Rio looks an awful lot like Stanford, Connecticut. <laughs> really? Of because we weren't in Rio. We were, we were, oh, gosh. We were in Stanford. Hey, you should have just gone with it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of people, well, maybe viewers don't know this, that the lion's share of the couple of hundred wow. uh, broadcasters of the Olympics, play-by-play -play people and even hosts, are not on site. We are at NBC Sports' headquarters in Stamford, Connecticut, which is a beautiful uh, broadcasting complex. But the entire, the only tennis, there, the, oh, we had a sideline reporter for tennis who was on site. And darn it, I forget her name. Uh, she, was, she was very good. And Mary Carrillo uh, was on site in Rio because she was hosting, she, she had other duties mm -hmm. at the Olympics and just did a little bit of tennis. The rest of us were all in a studio. We were on site for the uh, for tennis for the 2012 Olympics in London, because tennis for the London Olympics was at uh, Wimbledon, and uh, they decided that being on site for that would be uh, meritorious. Um, that was really cool, um, and the, the the Rio Olympics were also really cool. Um, but uh, no, it was <laughs> we were not there, and I did not, you know, experience um, any of the panema or any of the delicious uh, Brazilian food 
but I can tell you that the Marriott in downtown Stanford is very <laughs> What about London? What about 2012? <laughs> let's go there. Let's let's go where you were on location. <laughs> Try to put my reporter's broadcast hat on here <laughs> and play off of you. And that was a thrill. London was a thrill just because, um, you know, the historic nature of the All England Club and having tennis on that site. And, and at, at the time, the storyline was that it was just a three-week turnaround between the championships at Wimbledon and then the Olympic Games three weeks later after the final. And how were they going to be able to turn the grass around and get it in shape? And what would the club look like sort of with Olympic branding versus, uh, you know, the normal, very green and purple uh, championships branding and, you know, just the whole thing. And it, and I had never, I can say this, um, I had never broadcast, if you watch <clears throat> the Tennis Channel um, has a rights holding agreement with Wimbledon where we, uh, we show a, a different, you show the matches in, on delay. I had never broadcast from that courtside bunker. Ooh. In the corner, you know. You, you yeah. Need sort of John McEnroe. And, and mm-hmm. the announcers are, when the players are walking, that, that low level. And I got to call the, I had a number of matches there, but I called the semis because Mary called the final, I think, or t- I, I can't remember. Who, I didn't call the final. I called the semi, the Del Potro I don't even remember who was in the match, but I called, yeah. with, I called with McEnroe in that bunker. And that was a goose bumper. I mean, if you're a tennis broadcaster to be down there with Mac at Wimbledon um, and they open that window to shoot handheld inside that bunker. And yeah, that was, I, I, I remember uh, Michelle Obama came, um, you know, Serena won the single Serena and Venus won the doubles. Bob and Mike won those Olympics. Um, it, was, it was a very American uh, Olympics. I remember I wasn't calling the women's final, but I snuck into like a photographer's well behind or next to that broadcast bunker during the medal ceremony for Serena or for Serena and Venus when they were playing the anthem. And I remember that was uh, sort of a special Things. So yeah, be, I just being around the club. It's I mean, even when you're there for the championships or the Olympics, it's 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 the hallowed ground of the sport, and, and being there under any circumstances is a, is a huge privilege. What I recall is that was not the first time you've snuck into a tennis event. <laughs> <laughs> As I've heard you talk about before in '91, going in and, and giving a twenty dollar bill to the chefs and you going in the back and watching Jimmy Connors and seeing that unfold the, the final now you fought off one match point. This is the match point. The final question of, <laughs> of my interview with, with great Brett Haber. I'm Brian Fenley. Dennis channel has gone through some really cool addition studio wise, if I'm not mistaken. And what's that been like being able to be on set there and, and noticing the advancements that they've had in the broadcast experience. Yeah, so we just moved into our new building. Like, it's literally still happening. And I just did, was very proud to be part of the first week uh, of shows in our, our new building in Santa Monica. Mm-hmm. And it, it, we, for uh, a long time, forever, uh, our studios were in Culver City uh, in a building that uh, also just for fun was the studio home of Tosh.0. Um, really? They, they wow. subleased, Tosh subleased from us. Another wow. Um, we would occasionally see Daniel and his dogs in the parking lot, but <laughs> don't have any great stories there. Um, but yeah, so uh, brand new, uh, the building's not new, but it, it's been completely gutted and refitted in, and it was re- my first time in it where I toured it when it was under construction once, but uh, I guess two weeks ago we did the Delray Beach, Florida event and the Abu Dhabi event from the studio. And I can tell you, Brian, it is the single nicest, most technologically advanced, wow. most pristine television studio I've ever set foot in. It is, I mean, we, we, we've been around for 
18, 17, 18 years now, we started broadcasting in a very, it's a room that is not bigger than your bedroom, uh, that on a set that did not have chairs. Um, we did not have a studio show at first. We just had sort of studio wraparounds to matches. I mean, this place is a joke how, uh, how buttoned up it is. Every detail, the studios are amazing. The facilities are amazing. And it's, I, I just think all, for those of us who've been there for a long time and, and, and for those who are newer, it's just a, an immense point of pride to know that, you know, a lot of people compare us to Golf Channel just because they're the other sort of single sport golf and tennis are grouped together for mm -hmm. right or wrong a lot of the times. Golf Channel's a lot older than we are. They've been around more, they're more established. Um, they, they have more infrastructure and history to call upon. And we're now 16, 17 years old. And I think it just represents this step in our evolution that makes us feel like, yeah, we kind of have made it. We have these, I'm sure you're aware, we have this, a couple new rights holding deals that started this year where we're the, you know, full 100% home now of ATP tour tennis. Every, <coughs> excuse me, every single event now is, is on our air. Um, the slams are, are a mix. The women, we have uh, much of the WTA schedule. So I think the, the combination of, of the events that we rights hold, our, our physical space, our, uh, you know, just, it, 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 you just, you have, your shoulders are a little more back when you yeah. come into work, uh, uh, when you come into a place like that. It was, I mean, it was, hey, listen, it was enjoyable before. It's, it's even more enjoyable now. And, you know, you know this having, you know, started to make your way through this business. We're lucky to work any place. Uh, to, I feel particularly lucky to work at this place and not just because of the building. Um, I, I work for very humane people, which as you may or may not know, isn't always the case sure. in this business. Um, yeah. they, they put a high premium on a, sort of the human component of, of what we do. We, we all travel together a lot uh, throughout the year. We're, we're a little, you know, traveling circus family. And uh, it's, it's one of the great joys uh, of my life to, to be part of it. I, and I, I know that sounds like, file that under stuff people say about the companies they work for. And I probably would say a version of that um, about wherever I work because it's smart to say that. I hope the sincerity yeah. that I feel in what I'm saying in this instance comes through um, because I, I really, really, really mean that. I, I, I haven't always felt that way about the places I've worked. I, I really, really feel that way about this place. Yeah, no, I totally feel that authenticity from you and just how proud you must feel from, from a place that had humble beginnings to I see. I, I, I feel immense pride about that. Yeah. And being a, I wasn't a total ground floor guy. I wasn't at the very beginning, but I've been there. It's been my primary job for 10 years. And um, so I don't, my, my boss called me an OG. Uh, <laughs> I took immense pride in that. I don't yes. know, there, there's some, there are some OG or people than me. Um, but if I'm on the OG list somewhere, I, that's a point of pride for me, but yeah, no huge, uh, pride about that place and, um, and what we've accomplished and, and the situation that we're in on a sports media landscape that is volatile, that is uncertain in a lot of areas in a sport that is not one of the um, finger quotes for sure here, one of the quote unquote four majors of American sports, but has found its place on the television landscape as one of the biggest growth networks, not just in sports, but in all of cable television in, a, in an unplugging era, right? In, in a cable sports viewership is on the decline. Ours has been on the rise because we found more homes through our new ownership and the, the, our rights holding deals have increased, not decreased. So, you know, we're all lucky and proud to be part of this thing. That, that was a bit of a commercial and uh, I will uh, yield back the balance of my time to the honorable uh, gentleman. <laughs> Your boss calls you an OG. I'm going to call you an OG. The sport is in good hands with Brett Haber of Tennis Channel. Really appreciate you, Brett. I'm Brian Fenley. It's an honor to have some of your time and to be able to check in after all these years. And I hope that we can continue to, to stay in touch and very, very proud of all that you're doing for the sport and broadcasting. 
Well, Brian, let me let me thank you and let me throw it right back at you and just say before you uh, hit the stop record button, um, you told a little bit of the story at the beginning. I uh, you said proud. I I'm proud of you. No. Oh. Uh, not very often that uh, you came up to me cold at the Memphis. Yeah. Tournament. I don't know how many years ago introduced yourself and you were impressive and that happens to us a lot. I remember that meeting. I remember your follow up. Um, you were and, and what you did with me and presumably other people in the business is the object lesson of how to do that, which is to introduce yourself and get out there and be persistent, but not annoying. And find, yeah, find and that's hard. I mean, I, I've learned, I mean, I've, let, let me be honest with you. That's, that's something that over time you learn, you, you feel it out. Right. It, it's, yeah. No, I, I, and that's, it, it is a fine line because yeah. and it's an, I remember, and the only reason I say that is because I remember being in that position with sure. people when I was starting and you were great. You sent tapes and I, I tried to respond. And uh, it's very, all I'm saying is it's very gratifying to see you succeed. Uh, you deserve uh, everything that you have and you're earning it and you're doing a great job. And uh, the pride is, is, is mutual and, uh, and strong. And uh, I, you know, here, I cheers my coffee to you. You're rocking it. Keep going, man. <laughs> cheers to you as well. <laughs>